the church say amen again. Amen. Uh, bless the, 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 the Bible verse says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Uh, this is a difficult situation. However, the Lord said he's working it out. Somebody say amen. It's quite different when it's family. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, when you have a, uh, a pastoral objective distance from the deceased person, uh, when it's family, somebody say family. Uh, when it's family, it, it turns into something totally different. And so to my family, this family, we want to, on behalf of all of these very fine preachers and uh, preachers of the word of God and the staff and the membership here at St. Paul, which Midge was one of, we want to extend our sincerest condolences. And this is, uh, is not puffery, but if there's anything that we could do for you at any time, please note that we will be, or we will avail ourselves of it. Somebody say amen. The program is simple. Uh, this is a celebration of life. Uh, the program is simple, uh, since Reverend Carlton, this is a celebration of life. Therefore, we can rejoice in the fact that we know where Midge is. We can know that uh, beyond any doubt in our mind that God has received her unto himself. Somebody say amen. amen. The only change that we have is that we'll have the prayer by Reverend Quentin, Reverend Dr. Quentin White, followed by the Old Testament scripture by Michelle A. Creer, and the New Testament scripture by Reverend Michelle D. Thomas. Let somebody say amen. amen. Let's pray. Let's eternal and gracious God, our Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who has brought us thus far along the way. We come this morning, O oh God, by our very presence to say how awesome you are and to just think about the wonders of thy creation. You put the stars in the heaven. And, O oh God, we have recently seen some of the miracles of your wondrous creation. This morning we come to praise thy name, to give you the glory and to give you the praise, O oh God, for all that you do. We come this morning, O oh gracious God, to say thank you. We can't say thank you enough. We thank you, O oh God, because you roused us from sleep this morning woke us from slumber, allowed us to put one limb in front of the other, to make it to hear the house of God, O oh gracious God, where you are worshiped and praised. We ask this morning, O oh God, on this day of sorrow for some, uh, that you might pour upon us precious Holy Spirit and presence of God, uh, a power and a presence that's able to strengthen us in times of weakness, a power and a presence that's able to uh, guide us and direct us through the thickets, the heavy thickets of this troublous world. We thank you this morning, O oh God, for we know that you're with us in all things. We ask you to, especially to be with this family that grieves, and uh, O oh God, in their emptiness and in their loneliness, uh, let them not feel forsaken because Jesus Christ is with them. Because he promised that he would uh, bless us and strengthen us whenever we need it. We ask you to surround this family, O oh God, uh, with the holiness, with the presence and the power of an almighty God. We pray, O oh gracious God, for all who are here today. Uh, we pray, O oh God, that uh, when the preacher preaches and brings the message that we might hear a word 
for our troubles and we might hear uh, a message uh, from the Lord and that we might understand this morning, O oh God, that you love us and that you have not left us and that you will never forsake us and that uh, we are the apple of thine eye and we thank you this morning, O oh gracious God, because we're not alone. The Holy Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is with us. We ask all of these blessings today in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. My heartfelt condolences and prayers for the family. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They pre th thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thank the Lord for the blessed reading of his word. Amen. Praise the Lord. John, the third chapter, verses 16 through 17. And God's word says, For God so loved the world that he gave his, own, his one and only Son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But God sent his son into the world to save the world through him. May God add a blessing to the hearers and the doers of his most precious and holy word. Amen. of a man is this who died for me set me died for me
the church say amen. amen. We're going to ask Sister Lanez Jackson now to come with our acknowledgments and resolutions. To the family, gave Hospice of the Western Reserve the privilege of co co companioning Marjorie and her family at the end of her life. During every visit, Marjorie shared her generous gratefulness and gratitude with a big smile on her face and a gentle nature. We are grateful for her memory. We would like to share a little about how we feel and how you may feel. Though we need to weep your loss, you dwell in a safe place in our hearts where no storm or night or pain can reach you. Your love was like a dawn brightening over our lives, awakening beneath the dark a future adventure of color. The sound of your voice found for us a new music, the brightening everything. Whatever you enfold in your gaze, quicken in the joy of its being. You place smiles like flowers on the altar of the heart. Your mind always sparkles with wonder at things. Through your eyes, we were brief. Your spirit was live, awake, and complete. We look forward to each other no longer from the old distance of our name. Now you dwell <clears throat> inside the rhythm of breath, as close to us as we are to ourselves. Though we cannot see you with outward eyes, we know your soul's gaze upon your face, smiling back at us with within everything to which we bring our best refinement. May you continue to inspire us to enter each day with a generous heart, to serve the call of courage and love until we see your beautiful face again in that land where there is no more se separation, where all tears will be wiped away from your mind and where we will never lose you again. Gratefully, the Hospice of Case Western Reserve Team. Resolution, 13th day of April in the year of 2024. We, the members of the Word Church, would like to extend our heartfelt compassion in the home going of Marjorie Hawkins. The family has lost a noble character, but God has promised in his great book, I will never leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The valley may be dark and the shadows deep, but oh, the shepherd God is lonely sheep. And though the groom, he'll lead me home by the Heavenly Father watches over me. Be it resolved that as a body of believers, we believe that death is not the final destination. Jesus died that we may have victory over death, and those that believe in him shall inherit eternal life. Be it resolved that in the commem commemoration of the passing of Marjorie Hawkins, we as a church will go devote our lives to winning more souls to Christ for the future building of the kingdom of God. Be it resolved that a copy of this resolution be given to the family and a copy be kept in our church record. In his name, Doctors R. A. and Victoria Vernon Founders. St. Paul African 
Methodist Episcopal Church. Words of comfort to the family. I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away all your tears, and there shall be no more death. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. Whereas Reverend Gregory and the First Lady Reverend Michelle Thomas, the officers and members of the St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church family, wish to, we could put into words the very real sense of loss which we experience personally in the home going of your loved one, Sister Marge, and extend our heartfelt prayers to you. Where is God in your where is God is your refuge and strength in time of trouble? Just know God can lift you up and give you strength to stand. We will remember her as a woman clothed with strength and dignity. She spoke with wisdom and faithful instruction was on her tongue. Whereas Marge indeed fought a good fight, she kept the faith even in pain. We say to the family, no matter what your t trials are or how big your mountains seem, the Lord is there to see you through. He will go in all to, to all extremes. Even though we do not always understand why things happen, so if your cross seems hard to bear and you know not what to do, the one who loves you most will be there to see you through. Be it resolved that we will remember the warm smile that Marsh displayed as she marched down the aisles with the mass choir in years past and how she just sang herself happy on some of her favorite songs. Your church family's prayer is that God will grant you peace in the months to come. May your sustaining precious memories and the deep abiding pressures of the Holy Spirit give you strength to meet each new day. Be it resolved that a copy of this resolution be given to the family on this 13th day of April, 2024, and a copy be kept in, on file at St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. My last request, please do not say I gave up, for to God's will I gave in. Do not, do, do not say I lost the battle, for it was God's war to lose or win. Please do not say how good I was, but that I did my best. Just say I tried so what was right, and I would not settle for less. Do not talk about what could have happened or could have been. It's over. It's done. Remember all the good times and love me despite the bad. But if you must do something, then I have one last request. Thank God for my soul's resting. Thank God for all who blessed and loved me. But most of all, thank God who loved me best. In the words of Maya Angelou, you was a phenomenal woman. Lynette Jackson Secretary, Reverend Gregory Scott Thomas, Pastor. We ask now for those persons who have been designated uh, to come now uh, and to offer remarks, memory, reflections. We ask that you would speak for two minutes each. Those persons who have been designated to come, uh, won't you come now to give remarks and memory reflections? Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Mass Choir of St. Paul, and I'm going to ask if they would just stand, and if anyone who is in the Mass Choir, past and present, if you would stand, if you're in the uh, congregation, um, if you would stand, please, as we salute this wonderful woman of God. Um, you know, uh, Marge had a, when she sung, it was a sweetness 
and a purity about her singing. When, when I first heard her, it was, a, it was a sweetness and a purity that I got from her, and I was just blessed by it. And then also, um, and sometimes in choir rehearsal, when um, we would say, who wants to pray tonight? And she would say, okay, I'll pray. And it was still that same sweetness when she would pray. And I said the other day, I felt like I was entered into the throne room when she would pray. I felt that. I felt that. She was a great spiritual force here at St. Paul for her musical abilities and for her spiritual abilities. She was a Levite in the Bible. You know, when the, the God, he, there were chosen singers who would go before the battle and they would sing. She would be in that group that would go out and sing. And so she, she was just beautiful. And in my closing, just um, there's a poem that I saw the other day, and it just reminded me of her. And this poem is titled, And Rest, and it's by Reverend Anthea Balaam. There's a moment in musical rehearsals when all the players, the choir, the woodwind, and brass, the strings and percussion, the entire orchestra stops. And there is peace. The conductor says two words and rest. Voices cease to sing. The woodwind put down oboes and clarinets. The brass lay down trumpets and trombones. And others do the same. Because the music is over, the, uh, there is no audience. There is no applause. But in that moment, quietness reigns. Yet the quiet that follows remain harmonious. There's a certain silence, a space, a reflection, and repose. The music is remembered, so we contemplate the highs and the lows. The passage of melody, sometimes we feel sad because the chords have drifted away, finished, completed. Some will feel loss, others experience relief, and others deep sadness. But together, we share that moment of closure when the conductor says, and rest. The other day, the conductor of her soul said, Marge, rest. That's what he did. And so we praise God for her, for her life. We will never forget her. We will always remember her, and her spirit will always dwell within this church. So we just thank God and praise God. We will continue to pray for you, Sonia. Amen. Praise the Lord, St. Paul. Praise the Lord. Can we give a hand clap of praise to this humble servant of God? I don't know whether you know it, St. Paul, but you had a jewel amongst jewels here in this church. God designed her special to just come and minister to us through her voice, even whatever old car she had. She used it to transport people not only to church, but around the community to doctor's appointments and stuff like that. Back at the old church, her and Miss Scott prepared all the meals for the repast, the conferences, and everything else. They didn't open nothing out of no can. They used it from scratch. <laughs> they didn't even ask the church to donate no money. They used their own money. They said, if you wanted to donate something, it better be out of the kitchen, out of your own pots and pans, not from the store. I remember when the twins were born, she asked my mother, what am I going to do with these twins? My mother said, just like you would do if you had one, raise the both of them. <laughs> <laughs> she was proud of her family, and she taught us faith, family, friends, community and neighborhood. She even worked in the polls down there in Old Second Calvary, but she was such a delight and I was honored to be her class leader. She even told Linnez, I don't want nobody else to be my class leader. She <laughs> said, if it can't be Miss Mabel, I don't want nobody else. <laughs> she and I shared some good times up and down the road when Denise Brazil connected us 
on the Sunday school line. All she said was, sis, what's the word for the day? She was singing a song, and I was praying. Denise said, wait a minute, wait a minute, why y'all leaving me out? <laughs> the last one we had, I told her, I said, don't let your past define your future. She taught us how to persevere, pray, believe, and hope no matter what you're going through. She said, stand on your faith because at the end of the day, that's all you got. She taught me how to just persevere and how to turn it over to God because he will take the impossible and make it into the possible. There's no limits to what he can do. So, baby sis, I salute you. I say, job well done. And one day we'll meet again, and I'm going to have another sermon, and you sing another song. Thank you so much, sweetheart. Hi, you guys. All right. Hey, son. I'll pass my notes to you guys in a minute. All right. Okay. I am uh, one of Marjorie's grandchildren. Um, like my Nana, I've been a caregiver my entire being. My Aunt Patricia, Nana's sister, told my mom that this was what I was going to do. And my mother never told me until I was deep in and was okay with the low pay rates of a caregiver. However, today I get to share this message that um, for the people that do not want to see their loved ones like this, I want to share what it was like being able to take care um, of my Nana. I still remember my first caregiving gig. It was Mama Jones and to know Mama Jones is to know it was an amazing gig. I learned so much from her, still hear her voice every time Will of Fortune is on. When she started to decline, I did not want to see her like that. One of the strongest women I have grown to love was becoming frail, and I did not want to have that as a memory. I wanted to remember her as she was. My employer, also my godmother, also a caregiver, very sternly told me that it wasn't about me and to imagine the hurt that I just didn't want to be a part of a world anymore that but at the hardest time of her life. I wasn't considering her feelings at all. And then she added, I was being paid for this. So the bottom line was I had to do this. This part is also what I signed up for. This was my first loss as a caregiver, but to someone I grew to love deeply. Throughout this journey, I learned to start individualizing and keeping their dignity intact. I was constantly doing things to increase their quality of life, even at my discomfort. Then I get the greatest gig of all. I was privileged enough to care for my Nana the way I cared for many strangers. I knew my Nana was in good hands because I was on her team. The family I was walking through, this process of caregiving was my family. So yes, I knew everything. I have been prepared for this. I was completely wrong because what I never experienced was the transcendent love that I was about to get. So this is why you should see them in this difficult time. This is why you want to see them like this. When she got to the Maliki house is when I started to remember things, but getting her ready for Christmas had to be my favorite. She did that for me. She was on board with the preparing but the day I busted in her room and screamed, Merry Christmas, Midge, and she's laying in the dark and not even a little bit in the mood for my shenanigans. Any other days I busted in there yelling, Midge, I was her midget. But Christmas, she tried to put me out the room several times. <laughs> I promise you, I wanted to call off Christmas, but like I said, this was also for me. So I said, Midge, this is for your fans. I prepared them for this moment. They need the shenanigans, so with or without your girlfriend, 
her wig. We are celebrating this time last year. You were miserable at so we are at baseline celebrating that. So she sassed me and told me to grab it. She told me she wasn't going to enjoy this. I just needed the permission. Let's go, Nana. All I did was put on the wig and make sure it was right. Then she perked up. So I handed her the brush, watching her take pride in her appearance. Gave me back the memory of watching her get ready for the holidays. I couldn't wait to get over there and watch her. I would be so mad at the tardiness of my mother because I wanted to watch her get ready. As I got older, old enough to get there on my own because we always lived real close to each, to each other, I would get there and watch her at her door, fix her hair, make sure her clothes look good, make sure her nails were perfect. And she always finished with a few squirts of perfume and she would squirt it in the air so I could run through it. And then I would just sneeze and sneeze because I am allergic, but I looked forward to it. <laughs> then she would gently pat the back of her hair and say, she's beautiful. And I would smile and say, she's beautiful. As she got ready for Christmas, I saw her face getting brighter and brighter and she is doing it all on her own. And I am just handing her stuff. And she asked for the perfume. She squirted it on herself as I remembered as a kid. Then she said, you want me to squirt it in the air so you can wave your arms in it? I said yes and swung my ears being so silly so I wouldn't burst into tears because there was never no crying in front of Nana. So because, because I think she remembered too and I did not know that those memories were just as essential for her as they were for me. There are also new memories that you get to create. Being there, I was forced into being Nana Stylist, not the girl that cared less about her appearance. I was doing hair, dislike that job. I was doing nails, dislike that job. I did not want the responsibility because I knew how important her appearance was and Nana did not hold back. We call this time fuss and brush because we fussed the entire time. I complained for the entire eight months about not liking having this responsibility at all, but I am sure I increased the quality of life for not only Nana, but myself. So on Thursday, I got to paint her nails one last time. I wanted to paint her nails because I knew the importance of her appearance. My mom thought that she gave the final okay, but I really did. That is why I wanted the task. I knew how important her appearance was for her, and I knew this because I pushed aside how I felt, and I saw her like that, and I wanted to honor that, honor that her appearance was important to her. Yet one last moment to brush and fuss with my Nana, one last memory that a picture can never capture. This is why experience, experiencing those memories, experience that love, and that is where the peace comes from. I have the pics and videos of the concerts we almost got kicked out of, the events we attended, but the memories that can't be captured, they come back. I am telling you, you want to experience that. If there are no other reflections at this time, we're asking that uh, Sister Diana Hawkins will come and read our obituary. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Midge was my aunt. She was spicy.
Marjorie Ann Hawkins, affectionately known as Midge, was born August 23rd, 1942 in Cleveland, Ohio to the late Evine Hawkins Sr. and Francis Hawkins. She departed her earthly vessel peacefully and went in to sing for the Lord on April 2nd, 2024. At an early age, Marjorie accepted the Lord Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior and soon found place at St. Paul AME Church on the west side of Cleveland, where later she became a member of the Mass Choir and several other ministries while in attendance there and was rebaptized as an adult by Reverend Rodney Thomas. Marjorie was raised on the west side of Cleveland and attended Cleveland Public Schools where she was in art and music programs. While in school, she sang with a group called the Bluebirds. She was also very athletic. She graduated from John Marshall High School, January of 1961. After high school, Marjorie married William Ed Jackson Sr. And to this union was born four beautiful children, twins, Tina and Teresa, William Jackson Jr. and Lavelle. Oops, sorry, my glasses here. She worked at Valley Spring Health Center where she used one of her God-given passions as a cook to serve the residents with love. Marjorie had a passion for drawing, cooking, singing, and had the voice of an angel with various pitch and range. In fact, Marjorie has been singing and drawing from as far back as she can remember. She said that her mother told her that she would be in, in her crib singing along with the songs that were playing. Marjorie sang in a group in the 1950s called the Divans. They performed during amateur hour on the Jean Carroll show. I didn't know that. Her favorite gospel singers were James Cleveland and Shirley Caesar. In addition to gospel music, another one of her favorite singers was Michael McDonald and the Doobie Brothers. She attended many of his concerts accompanied by her granddaughters and daughters. She sang in many church choirs, but ultimately, she found her place singing for St. Paul AME for many years. To hear her singing is a true blessing. For her family and anyone who has had the privilege of being able to cook with her while she's, while she's singing her favorite gospel songs, as a multitude of blessed memories. Marjorie loved drawing and coloring as much as she loved singing. Her attention to detail is to, the admire, to be admired, and you can tell that she puts her heart into her craft. She draws as beautifully as she sings. Although Marjorie was a very passionate, I'm sorry, private person, she absolutely adored spending time with family and friends, and her presence will truly be missed by all who spent any amount of time with her. Her memory will live forever. Marjorie was preceded in death by both of her parents, Avine Sr. and Francis Hawkins, brother Avine Hawkins Jr., sister Patricia Austin, brother Ronald Oscar, Ronald Hawkins Sr., I'm sorry, grandson Anthony Jackson, granddaughter Tiana Jackson. Marjorie leaves to cherish her memory, children, Tina Jackson from Akron, Ohio, Teresa Jackson in Cleveland, Ohio, William and Sheila Jackson Jr. in Cleveland, Ohio, Lavelle and Sonia Jackson from Garfield Heights, 16 grandchildren, 34 great-grandchildren, and one great-great-grandchild. She also leaves many fond memories to cherish, a sister-in-law, Bernice Hawkins from Columbus, Ohio, nieces and nephews, as well as a great host of cousins and friends. We all love you, your loving family.
Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. I have a very small vignette that uh, we would like to share with you. But before that comes on, Christopher, let's hear the word of the Lord that's found in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse number six. I saw some of my brothers with their Bibles, and so I gave them an advance warning to where we would be today. Uh, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse number six, reading from the New, in a New International Version. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all those who have longed for his appearing. The discourse today, the thought today is simply from the perspective of arrivals and departures. Christopher. What does that sound like? <clears throat> it, it sounds like a plane taking off. Uh, we love to travel by plane, I, I do personally, uh, because it gets you there quicker. There are some people that like to drive, and the older we get, we don't want to drive anymore. I wish I had somebody in the house that could verify that fact. And when I need to go to a place where we're driving, I'd like somebody else to drive so that I can sit back, relax, and enjoy the scenery. Somebody say amen. Plane trips to me are challenging too because you have to arrive there earlier, two hours they say, an hour and a half earlier, or you're at risk of losing your departure time. A week ago, I cited and referred to the Malaysian airliner flight MH370. That airliner had disappeared over the South China Sea on, April, on March 8, 2014. 239 people departed on a routine red-eye flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing, China. After only 38 minutes from takeoff, this aircraft lost communications with the air traffic control. This Boeing 777 departed but never ever landed. This dissuaded and disconsolate family had searched for evidence what happened to this aircraft and the 239 souls that went into eternity without evidence. What happened is the question. Was there foul play? Was the Russians engaged in this and shot down the plane? Who was responsible is the question. These questions have been unanswered for over a decade. The plane is still missing. You and I regrettably don't know when the Lord will call us home. Therefore, it is imperative of us to be able to love each other each day to its fullest, to enjoy the fellowship of friends and family, and to enjoy life, to embrace every conceivable opportunity to tell one another that you love them. Each of us have a birthday, arrival date, and each of us have a departure date or date of death. And the unfortunate thing is, is that we have to be able to embrace the dash in between our birth, come on somebody, and our death. One preacher I remember preached on, he said, the dash between two dates. And so you and I don't need to frolic around with our time because the older I get, the less time I have on this earth. Somebody say amen. The older I get, the less I want to engage in frivolous activities or fighting about things that really don't make a difference anyhow. I wish I had a witness in the house. 
the older I get, I, I appreciate seeing the, the beauty of nature. The older I get, I, I love to see flowers. I called my wife. I was captured by the flowers this week and saw the spring roses budding, and I just was overtaken by them. We got to be able to enjoy life because time, come on, Lavelle, is precious. When, when traveling, especially flying, uh, you have a fixed departure date. That Malaysian aircraft took off at 1241 Malaysian time. You know, sometimes departure times sneak up on us and they're here right before we're prepared. Uh, Marge did not, Mitch did not, uh, Marjorie did not set her but departure time. No, it, it was the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings. He sets each of our departure time. But I submit to you that the Lord saw her suffering, saw her pain, saw the sorrow and the depreciating nature of her body and set a departure date and time. God looked at her depreciating body and said, well, you won't make it to April 5th, but you will end your, end your time, your time of departure, your time, the time that your flight is taking off, the time that you're going to see Jesus face to face will be April 4th, 2014. Uh, Marge was always a very kind and wonderful person. Relating back to the MH370, the last words that came from the radar was Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh, 120.9, good night. Flight 370 replied back, good night, Malaysian 370. I'm saying that to say this because we don't know when our last conversations will be. You want your last conversation to be sweet. You want your last conversation to be uh, riddled with the word of God. I, re I, remember, I remember the last time I talked to Marge and I looked her squarely. You, some of you were there. I looked her squarely in her eyes and I said, let's repeat together the 23rd Psalm. You know what she did? You know, sometimes you may forget your great-great-grandchildren, but when you know the Word of God, it stays there. And what was so incredible by, by that experience, it, it was ministry to me because she looked me eye, eye to eye and recited every single word of the 23rd Psalm. You, you better make sure your last your last statements, your last message, your last uh, uh, communication with your family is good, wholesome, loving, kind, because we don't know when our last days are there. In this passage, we find the Apostle Paul wavering because he wanted to stay, but he had signs in his body and signs from the Lord that the end was now approaching. Isn't it gracious of God to give us an inkling to know that time may be short? In the life of Midge, uh, uh, the Lord was kind and gracious to be able to share with the family, to be able to see her to, uh, each day, and their family members and friends could go and visit with her. As I looked at the exceptional care that they gave at Malachi House, that they loved her, they cared for her, grew attached to her. I'm just glad that she was able to share with me as a preacher uh, the fleeting moments of life. In this epistle, the Apostle Paul is now at the end of his life. This beleaguered apostle is now incarcerated in a maximum security prison. The Apostle Paul is now making a declaration, a dying declaration about what he wants done and who he wants to see. The Apostle Paul is passing, parenthetically, the torch to others like Timothy and to tie this. Uh, the, the, the church was now being impressed, uh, oppressed, and, 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 and they're being challenged by bad leadership in the context of the uh, political instability. The Apostle Paul is trying to simply just tell Timothy, he's, he's trying to tell Titus that you need to march on. And I want to share with this family that that, that, that time period, that 
Midge had in that Valaki house, she was simply, come on somebody, she was simply passing the torch. See, sometimes we stay too long at a place. Somebody say amen. I, I don't ever, I don't ever want to be at a place where I'm not welcome. I don't ever want to be a pastor of a church that I'm not welcome at. Somebody say amen. I, I don't want to be in somebody's home. Somebody say amen. That they don't want me there. And if you don't want me at your home, just tell me. Say, well, brother, you know, it, it's just time for you to go. And, and so God is so wonderful in the fact of being able to whisper into the family's ears that now it's time to pass the torch to a new generation. I remember the inaugural address by John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And he said in his inaugural address in 1960, I, I wasn't around, somebody say amen. However, I remember, I remember, I remember hearing and he said, the, 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 the time is now. The torch is being passed to a new generation. It's being passed to somebody that can do something about our situation. It's being passed to somebody that knows Jesus. That, that's what my, Marge was doing. That's what Mitch was doing. She was simply saying, that, that I, I want to hear songs from the church. I, I don't want to hear blues. I don't want to hear country. I don't want to hear R&B. I want to hear the songs of Zion. And those were the songs that made a difference in my life. The, the point I'm making is that the torch is now being passed. And the question is, who will take over? The leadership of the family? Who will take over the mantle of Jesus? Remember the Old Testament uh, prophet Elijah was about to depart. And as you read the Bible, you notice that, that he was to be caught up in a whirlwind. And then Elijah went to Elisha, uh, Elijah. Elisha went to Elijah and said, uh, what, uh, Elijah asked him, what do, you, what do you really want? He said, I want a double portion of your anointing. Uh, you, you'll miss this. I want to be able to do what you do. But then I want to be able to go further th than you do. One of the things that we have failed our parents, our grandparents, is the fact that they were passing the torch to us and they wanted us to go further. This is the first generation in history that's going backwards. And I submit to you, when you go backwards, you're losing ground. And when you're going backwards, you don't have a legacy to pass on to your successive generation. What, what sort of legacy did Midge have? Well, first of all, she was always concerned about somebody else. She was always concerned about her children, her, her grandchildren. Uh, she was concerned about the fact that the, some of them passed prematurely. She was concerned about them. Not, not only was she concerned about family. Come on, come on, Mabel. She was concerned about church. Every opportunity that she had to come into the church, she, she wasted no time. Some of us, some of us, some of us have luxury cars. Some of us have palatial homes. Some of us have every conceivable uh, financial blessing, yet at the same time, we're missing the mark because we're not including the Lord Jesus in the context. Uh, there's a song that Aretha Franklin or, or Rolanda could sing. Come on, somebody. How I got over. My soul looks back and wonders how I got over. It wasn't because of my intellect. It wasn't because of my money. It was because of Jesus. That's how we got over. That's how we're blessed. 
that's how we made it. That's how we did it. Like George and Weezy made it to the east side in a deluxe apartment in a sky high high. How I got over because the Lord blessed me to get over. But you don't get over by yourself. You get over to bless somebody else. To pull somebody else to where you are. She was always concerned about her family, concerned about her church. She would call me and say, well, pastor, I need to mail in my tithes. I said, listen to me, please. I'm concerned about you, and I'm not concerned about your money. She said, well, look, I, I, I don't care what you say. And in the backdrop, I was saying, praise the Lord, saints. <laughs> but Because <laughs> you sure needed it. But, but anyhow, she was always faithful. In this text, it brings out something very strong, and I'm going to let you go. That it first of all says that I'm being poured out. Poured out. Sorry, trustees. Poured out like a drink offering. You know, at a funeral, uh, I saw one of my cousin's funeral, and the brothers from the street, come on somebody, yeah, had brought to the gravesite, thank you, Michelle, uh, some Patron 1800. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe, maybe y'all, you know, you, you, you holy rollers don't know what I'm talking about. But anyways, the brothers took a sip of this Patron 1800, but they poured some out at the gravesite. And, 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 and the brothers didn't know that they were being biblical. I'm not suggesting you do that, but the brothers knew that they did not know that they were being biblical because this, this, this scripture points out that the Apostle Paul says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. And the offering I am offering of is myself. I'm being poured out. It was, it was like in the Levitical code that when the offering was, was on the uh, offering block and when it was being roasted, you, they would pour over a libation, and it would be a fragrant aroma to God. That, that's the way our life has to be. When, when people can look at your life when it's all over and say that she was sweet, you said that. Look at your life when it was all over and say that she, she never said a crossword about anybody. Look over your life, that, that, that's the libation, being poured out like a drink offering. And then the next thing is departure time. There is a Greek word that Quentin showed me how to pronounce, analusio. I was pronouncing analusis. We don't know who's right, who's wrong, but it's a Greek word that means departure. Come on, somebody. It's a term that talks about when a sailor is setting ship, setting sail, they pull up the anchor. Mm-hmm. They pull up the anchor so that they can, uh, they can sail away to the location of choice. Come on, somebody. So I want to share with you, on April 4th, I don't know the exact time. Everybody had to leave because Midge had to be with Jesus and had to let everybody go. But on, March, on, on April 4th, uh, the Lord said, it's time for you to pull up the anchor. Come on, somebody. Pull up the anchor of your life. I know, I know your family will miss you. I know your church will miss you. I know everybody will miss you. I, but I want you to pull up anchor and set sail to your heavenly home. I want you to pull up your anchor and to go where you see Jesus. To go where you see family. To go where you see friends. To go to a location. There's a song that we sing that's very appropriate. Uh, I'll fly away. And the lyrics say, one glad morning.
Come on, somebody. When this life is over, I'll help me out. Come on. Fly away to a home on God's celestial shores. I'll fly away. Oh, oh, I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away when I. to garnish her home going with your presence and with flowers. Those who wish to come and to be flower escorts, we'd be delighted that you would come now. Also further beseech those individuals that have been selected as pallbearers to please come. Ministers, please come and join me. I said the failure 
by God. It's in me. 